Hey, good day, fellas. Welcome to Uncensored Advice for Men. On today's show, we're going to have a conversation with a psychotherapist who's probably going to make me cry. Dudes, <laughs> let's welcome Tess to the show. <laughs> Tess, welcome here. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So what the heck is psychotherapy? <laughs> oh, okay. We're going to start off easy. <laughs> um, well, so uh, the difference between like psychotherapy and being a psychologist is it just means that I'm a master's level. So I have a, a, a master's degree in marriage and family therapy and psychotherapy is essentially what people think it is. I mean, it's, it's every therapist has their own modalities and ways in which they treat people. But um, mainly, you know, it's talk therapy. It's what we, you know, see. I, I hate, hate the depiction of therapy on TV because I think it, no one's ever done a really good job of really showing what it's like. Because I think everyone, right, that's that big thing. People are so fearful of going and checking it out because they think it's, right, they think that we get paid in tears <laughs> or that we're going to, that we're going to, um, you know, that you're lying on a couch or that, you know, you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. And that's not at all what very modern psycho psychotherapy, psychology, like all of that has become. It's really about um, sitting down and talking about like whether it's your past or whether it's what you want for the future or how you're feeling today of, you know, like talking about your life. And some people come to see me because they have um, one particular issue that they want to work on. And then some people come because for them, this is like their maintenance, you know, for them to come and talk to someone every two weeks. It's like, yeah, this is what I do. This is my, you know, my exercise, my whatever it is. Right. Yeah. yeah like, you know, for your vehicle, it's like changing, yes. you know, rotating your tires, changing your oil. So you yeah. don't change men's oil, but you, you help maintain <laughs> right? what's going on between their ears. Yes. Yes. You know, I've read in this show uncensored advice for men and, and coaching guys and just spend a lot of time with guys. I'm a guy. Right. But mm -hmm. like, our biggest issue, I think, is <laughs> I'm gonna I'll give you two between our ears and between our legs. Those yes. two, <laughs> those two <laughs> brains get us in the most trouble. All right. So let's let's go upstairs and let's talk about, you know, between our ears. Like what in in terms of men and their mindset or their their things that they're struggling with, what do you get most when when guys ask you for help? Like what's that the issue or the problem that most men if you bundled them all in a bucket, what mm -hmm. do you see the most? Um, well, the most common sort of in psychology terms, I think it's anxiety, mm -hmm. right? This is the biggest thing that I see with all my clients across the board, especially young people, right? Um, but it's anxiety. It's anxiety around, um, you know, while women worry a lot about, will I meet someone? Will I meet the one? Men are much more worried about like, you know, can I talk to women? You know, how do I talk to them? How do I relate to them? How do I navigate these kinds of relationships? And then when it comes to work, it's the anxiety around, you know, achievement mm -hmm. and, um, you know, achieving what they want to achieve work-wise, making money, feeling like, they can um, provide for a family. I mean, our world is very different than what it was 50 plus years ago, but there is this, is this innate thing that, you know, that women do on the whole, I don't want to make sweeping gestures, but you know, like there is that need to want to nurture and build a family and all that. And for men, it's really, you know, it's really about like, can I provide for a family yeah. at its like real base core again? I'm in the San Francisco Bay area. Like this is, you know, everyone has different paths and everyone's doing different things, but on the whole, the clients that come to me, it's really about this, you know, like, will I, am I doing it right? And will I make it all happen for myself? Yeah. So I, I would say if, if you bundled all of my fears, concerns, anxieties into, you know, different buckets, right. The one about pro providing for family mm -hmm. is probably over the years, you know, like, is probably a heavy bucket, right? So how yeah. do you, how do you walk a guy like me through? Because <laughs> in the audience, right? Here's, let me describe yeah. some of my audience members. The majority of us are, I mean, this is a show for guys, even though we do have some female listeners and we have, um, you know, they wouldn't, people wouldn't consider themselves one or the other, right? But they, we, mm -hmm. we do have that audience, but like the, it's mostly around men. The show is called Uncensored Advice for Men. But, you know, most of us guys are hardwired in terms of drive, 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 career, 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 money, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Success, right? Maybe we had mommy or daddy issues and maybe that's why we're trying to get validation through this. But like, 
why why do you think this is such a big issue and then how do we work through it like maybe maybe do some psychoanalysis on me or psychotherapy <laughs> on me like fix me fix me so i can help others right well I you know, I mean, I will say that as much as our world has changed, the modern world, technology, everything, we are very much like our DNA is very much that cave person DNA, right? And we see this all the time with the fight, flight, freeze. And one of the biggest issues that I see with my clients across the board is negative thinking. Like people struggle with thinking negatively and they're like, why do I think this way? And it's like, you think negatively because our brains and bodies were designed for survival. Mm -hmm. for staying alive. And so when, you know, once upon a time when we left our, you know, our small village or left our tribe, we had to be on hyper alert in order to stay alive. And so that, that, you know, that's what we're doing today. It's just in a more modern sense. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think if that comes back to, if you think about the you know, for men and women, it's again, you know, men were the providers, women were the nurturers, gatherers. And I think that that's still a big part of how we see ourselves and how we are. I mean, I will say just for myself, because a bit of how my father raised my sister and I, um, and both my parents, like what they instilled in me was this idea of achievement and drive and desire and, um, you know, going after the things that I, I want. But it's interesting when I talk to my male clients, I realize like there is a difference between my drive is very different than their drive, right? Cause their drive is very much about, um, you know, like if a family's falling apart, it's really looked to the man to provide. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's the same because I have a son who's 14 and he's had issues with anxiety over the years. And it's like, when your kids are struggling, people look to the mom, people look to the woman, right? Like, we have our own things that we struggle with. So, I, you know, do I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing or that it's wrong. I think it's like anything else in life where is it a, um, you know, is your drive and desire to achieve? Is it getting in your way of being happy? Is it getting in your way of having healthy relationships? Is, is it getting in your way of, you know, feeling um, satisfied? You know, is it, is it, so let me ask you this, right? So is yeah. it all, is it all been about achievement, achievement, achievement? Like I'll be happy when this happens or I'll be able to settle down or, or, um, you know, take a vacation or do any of these things when these things happen? Or do you feel like, no, I, I have, it's a, I have it in good balance. No, I would say nothing in my life is, has good balance, right? I'm okay. not a guy who's <laughs> balanced, right? No, no one's ever gone, hey, Josh, stable, <laughs> balanced. <laughs> no, so that doesn't describe me. Uh, I would say in terms of provision, right? Or the, the pains or anxieties or fears that I have is, you know, like there's been times, you know, I've, I've gone through bankruptcy and I've gone through, you know, food stamps. And then I've, then the, the next day I was in venture capital and private equity, right? So it's like, uh -huh. I've, I've hit many different sides of, the the hierarchy of needs right but mm -hmm. when you know when you don't have enough then what's enough right but like if you don't have enough to pay your basic bills the needs are you you, you turn into the hunter what do i need to do to go you know yeah. hunt something and bring in the money when you start making more money then you know then it's the 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 anxiety shifts and then you start going you know bigger car bigger you know house or or a house or um or you know, you start comparing yourself to other people, but I think, yeah. um, did that answer your question or did I just kind of like go all over? No, the place? Well, but I mean, so at this point in your life, where do you think you're at? Like, cause it sounds like you've had some success. You've had some low, some high, it sounds yeah. like you're on a high right now on a, on a trajectory. So do you feel like, is your life right now just all about bigger house, bigger car or no, I think, I think the bankruptcy was a really good like thing for my heart, my brain. And like, I mean, uh, also humility wise, um, I think now I, I, I'm definitely focused on, you know, growing and, and building and such investing, you know, but there's like certain number in my head that, you know, as we hit that and as we grow, I don't need any more than that. So then mm -hmm. it just turns everything into an investing. So I think right now I'm focused on creating better stability for myself and, and my family and the businesses that we work with mm -hmm. and then do it for others. I think, I think, yeah. and I might be wrong. Like if I won the lottery, like who knows what I would do. Like, All right. Peace out, everybody. I'm out. <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that's where, I think that's where I'm at is I don't, I don't need 
other people to say I'm successful anymore. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that, I, to me, that feels like that's you're, you're getting to the other side, right? We're, we're always, we're never at the other end, right? We're never perfect. Yeah. We're never, we're constantly evolving, but really in the end, I mean, people ask me like, what is, you know, how do you know if I'm cured or how do I know if I'm okay? <laughs> and, and in, in a lot of ways, I think that it's really about getting to a point of having a, a enough self-awareness, enough yeah. awareness around, you know, these are my thoughts. These are my feelings. I can identify them and being able to in real time, stop yourself and say like, I, in this moment in time, I am happy. Like yeah. in this moment in time, I'm going to enjoy this conversation that we're having. I'm not going to worry so much about like how many people are listening or what I'm going to say next. Like I'm being present in the present moment. I mean, I think that's really what we're all trying to achieve is learning how to be happy with who we are in yeah. the here and now. Right. Because right. The biggest thing, if you think about like the diet industry and losing weight and, and all of that, it, you, you know, the first thing that they tell you is, is that if you want to lose weight or get healthy or change your habits is you've got to really love who you are today. Mm. You know, you've got to love where you are, who you are, what's happening in the, in this moment. And then you can have that self-love, that desire to want to move forward. If you are constantly living and thinking like, I am not a worthy person, you know, once I make a million dollars a year, I will be a worthy person. Mm. Then, then that is what you're constantly going to be chasing. And, and what you're truly saying to yourself is, is that the person that I am here and today now isn't good enough. All right. Let's dig on that. As you were talking, I started <laughs> yeah. going, oh, okay. There's something here, right? So loving yourself in a guy's mind is not just masturbation, right? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> That's a, that is a way to love yourself, but I guess yeah. <laughs> in loving yourself, what do you mean to, you know, I'm not yeah. a, I'm not a worthy person. What does a healthy male love for himself look like? It is being able to see yourself in a very humane way, the way in which others see you with compassion and with kindness. And I think that when people hear, you know, being compassionate with yourself, being kind to yourself, it's not lying to yourself. It's not saying like, you know, uh, I'm the most wonderful person in the world and I'm awesome at this and I'm awesome at that. Right. Like, I think that's a bit of what happens, right. Mm -hmm. We go, we, we swing the, these pendulums of feeling like really low and then feeling like, you know, um, in order for women to be attracted to me, for people to be attracted to me, right. Like I need to be this kind of macho, um, I'm wonderful. I'm great narcissist, but really it's about being able to really like the person that you are and being able to see that like, okay, these are these things I want to work on. These things need to like, you know, I want to, uh, get, you know, put the phone down more and get more focused at work. And I want to, you know, just these little things, right. These things that you want to improve, but it's, but it's being able to see yourself through this lens of, you know, compassion and humanity and, and the way in which other people see you, right. Cause we are always our harshest critics. We are yeah. so rough with ourselves. And then, and so it's being able to step outside of ourselves and say like, no, that's not true. Like I am very successful at work or I am liked or people enjoy being around me. Um, but these are these mm -hmm. things I need to work on. Right. Yeah. yeah I think if, so my ego right? My ego constantly has to get kicked in the nuts to, to, you know, level out and create better balance. Mm -hmm. um, stepping outside myself. And most of the time it's my ego because I'm trying to prove something. It's, it's out of my insecurity really. So it's like the, the questions that I am internally, like, as I'm meeting people, I'm like, do people like me? Do, do people respect me? Am I good enough? When, when people look at, you know, some of my failures that they're going, ah, Josh is a you know, fucking loser or, you know, failure over here. Like th those co like co thoughts, I'm constantly worried about what other people think about me. Right. Uh -huh. So, and then do I even think about myself? No, I'm thinking about what other people think about yeah. me. All right. So how does a guy like me learn to in, like learn to manage that, the, that internal dialogue better Yeah. or more healthy? So you've done step one, which is the awareness of it, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's, it all starts with awareness. If you, if you don't have awareness, if, if, if you're thinking to yourself right now, I have no idea what I'm thinking or feeling like 
I can't, I don't know what my thoughts are. Like that's where you really want to start. So it sounds like you have this awareness. You have this awareness of this is what I'm thinking. This is preoccupying my thoughts. So I would say the next step would be you have this awareness. So it's really about stopping yourself, right? Because you have a choice in that moment, right? You have a choice to kind of go down that road of, of um, you know, beating yourself up, which I think for a lot of people, right, that, that can feel good sometimes. Like there is that sadistic part of ourselves, right? That like kind of- The whips and chains up. and yes. stuff like that, yeah. right? <laughs> so you can go down that road which in many ways, while it's difficult, if it's, if it's something that you do a lot, it's very comfortable. Mm. So you, what it forces you to do is you have to do the uncomfortable thing, which is being able to say to yourself, stop, stop, right? Like, you know, what other people think of me really doesn't matter. Like what would happen if, if, uh, if, you know, it didn't matter if w- what anyone thought about me, that that didn't change anything for me. And you know, the big thing that I always tell people is, is that it, it's a little bit of like, we are very self-involved people, right? We are self-involved. We think about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So guess what? People are thinking <laughs> about you that much, right? Like, you know, I wonder and, what and Josh I, is up to. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that if someone is even, whatever someone's thinking about you, it's so fleeting, right? It is yeah. so fleeting of like, Oh, Josh declared bankruptcy. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. And then it's on to the next thing, right? (laughs) Who's shiny squirrel, you know, like that's it. Exactly. Like we are, we are self-involved and that, and on top of that, what someone thinks of you and how they think about that is so much about themselves, right? Like how anybody thinks about your success and, and all of that to me, in my mind, when I take a step back and I hear you talking about your life, I think to myself, I'm not thinking to myself, oh, what a loser. I'm thinking about God, that takes a lot of guts, like that you are a risk taker, right? You're a risk taker. You're willing to put yourself out there. It sounds like you've had some low points that you learned from them, which is what these low points in our lives are about learning about ourselves, right? Learning about what we need to do differently next time. And so that's the other part of it too, is recognizing like, people aren't paying attention to me. What they think about me has really got to do with themselves and that people are probably a lot more kinder than I'm really thinking that they are. Because again, the people that are nasty, right? Those people that are on the internet that writing nasty thoughts, the trolls, like they are not worth your time or energy wondering at all because that's (laughs) what they are, right? Like there's a great, I love, um, and um, I guess it's probably not a lot of your listeners have read Brene Brown. Oh, I love Brene. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, she's all, she studies vulnerability and shame and her book, Daring Greatly is based on that Theodore Roosevelt quote. Yeah. And I, and I say this to my clients all the time, which is in that quote, Theodore Roosevelt's talking about like, you know, there's really two different kinds of people. They're the people that are in the stands and they're people that are in the arena, sweating mm-hmm. it out, yeah. you know, and when you're in the arena, you're sweating it out, you're getting dirty. It's difficult. It's hard. Or you can be someone in the stands criticizing. Yeah. So there's a lot of this is like, who, whose opinions do you care about? You know? Mm. And to me, what Brene Brown says in the book is, is like, if you're not in that arena with me, if you're not sweating it out with me in this arena, then you don't, I'm not going to listen to you. You've got nothing I want to hear. Right. So it's easy to be in the cheap seats. It's easy. It's simple. Yeah. Right. It's hard to be in the one sweating it out. It's hard to put yourself out there and say, I'm going to do this thing. Watch me go right? Putting yeah. up a podcast, all of that takes a tremendous amount of guts. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I forgot that, that quote, you know, it's, it's a person in the arena. It's, yeah. it's so true because the freaking trolls are up on their cheap seats in the nosebleed yeah. section. They're typing away on their stupid Twitter or whatever. And they're, they're making fun of people that, and they, I think that is out of their insecurity because they're too afraid to jump in or yeah. they critique and make themselves feel better. Thanks for that. That was cool. I feel better. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Next session. (laughs) But you know, um, I, a guy we call coach, he's in one of my uh, men's groups and he, he says, people's opinion of me are none of my business. Yeah. And I was like, ah, and then he also says, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about, (laughs) you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. No, it's true. It's true. But I, yeah, yeah. I will often say that too. What other people think of me is none of my business. And that's that part of like, because we see everybody through our own lens, yeah. right? Our own, our own perspective, our own lens, our own stuff. And so, you know, that's that other thing about other people's opinions. It's like, you, you take it in, 
hear it. And then you've got to decide for yourself, you know, what feels right to you. How did you get into this world of psychotherapy? (laughs) (laughs) How does that even start? Um, so I actually, my big dream in life when I was young was I wanted to work in Hollywood. I was a film major in college. And I wanted to be like the female Martin Scorsese. That was my dream. And I, I, you know, was going to do all that. And then I quickly realized like, while I was in college and film school, I was like, Oh God, I really don't enjoy shoot. Like being like, I like directing, but I didn't really like being a, you know, shooting on film and editing. And, you know, again, this was like the nineties. So life was a little different. Like we were using those old school films and like cutting things, but like physically cutting the tape, but, (laughs) um, you know, I I realized I didn't really like that. So I was like, okay, what else do I want to do? And I, you know, I was, um, my aunt was in the business and she got me an internship when I was in college at Columbia pictures. And I worked in PR and I was like, oh, I like PR, but it's the end, right? Like the movie's over and now they're promoting it. And I was like, so what's the beginning? And I started, that's when I started getting into representing actors and Ah, I worked in San Francisco because that's where I'm from. And then when I was 24, I went to LA and I was, um, I worked for a talent agency and then I worked for a talent manager. And when I was 27, I had my own quarter life crisis of like, from the outside looking in, I had it all right. I had this job that people envied and wanted. And I was like, you know, on my way to success. And, and I was so miserable. I was going into the bathroom crying. Like it was just not, you know, it, it, it was this dream that I had had for so long. Like this was my identity and, you know, I worked in Hollywood and this is what made me special and important. And I, I really hated it. (laughs) Like I've never really gelled with LA. Um, I like going there and visiting there now, but you know, I just, I'm a Northern California girl. So um, yeah, I just, I left it all behind. And, and the big thing, one, the thing that I realized was that that what I really liked about my job and what I was really good about my with job was was really good at listening to these actors and their problems. And I was good at talking to them and I was good at like taking them off the ledge and, and kind of knowing like this person needs to hear this, this person needs to hear that this person needs this, this, you know? And so I was good at managing personalities. And so that's when I started, you know, getting interested in psychology and I went from there, Yeah, you know? So that was the evolution of that you know, actors, right. We're all actors, right. We're all wearing a mask and we're all, you know, prancing around and and acting. Right. So what do we want people to see now from an insider's perspective? So I ultimately, I I just kind of connected dots in my head, (laughs) working with actors got you into psychotherapy. (laughs) That's that's pretty funny. All right. So, (laughs) so, but working with actors, right. You worked with some cool actors and you know mm-hmm. you're spending time with them and you're like walking them off the edge as an agent as a manager holy moly you're consistently going hey this is not a big deal someone made fun of your dress someone did this whatever mm-hmm. right so you're constantly working in those kind of issues with celebrities we on the outside only get to look through the square tube and we go wow they look great everything's put together mm-hmm. what is the reality of celebrity you know like what 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 you've uncovered which ultimately got into psychotherapy. So (laughs) that might've been a softball question. (laughs) No, I mean, so the biggest thing is, is that I think that there is no overnight success. I think that that's one of the things, like what was so interesting was they, you would, they would write these stories about actors and being like, oh my God, the new ingenue, the new sensation, as if this person had walked out (laughs) yesterday and landed in Hollywood. And the clients that we had that were, gaining a lot of success, even if they were 20, you know, 25, they had been working since they were teenagers. Like, you know, no, no 25 year old wakes up and ends up in Hollywood and then lands that first gig that, that it takes a long time to get really good at what you're doing. And I watched people as they came, it's like, you have to like, you know, you learn about acting and then there's this other part about like, you have to learn how to audition. And then, you know, you're getting to know people and people start to get to know your name. And, and I've, I've seen that from that lens and just seeing that, you know, even, even though it seems like someone just popped out in the middle of nowhere, it's like, no, someone's been doing this for a long, long time. Yeah. And, and I think that that's one of the pieces about the world that we live in today, because there's such this instant celebrity, there's such that instant TikTok, like, right. Yeah. Like piece of that. And, but if you want to have a lasting career, that's not dependent upon this fat or that fat or that 
or TikTok's algorithm, right? Or Instagram's right. algorithm. It really means that it's going to take just like the Malcolm Gladwell, was it? or 10,000 hours. 10,000 yeah. hours. It's yeah. going to take 10,000. Yeah. Outliers. That's it. I mean, it's, it's, you can't get away from that. And so that's a lot of what I saw was, and that, you know, it's, there is the glitz and glam of Hollywood. It is cool and exciting, but I've been to those parties. Like they're not that fun. Like they, <laughs> they, they, you, they, it looks right. Like, I think it looks on the outside. It looks super cool. And to talk about it is super cool, but being there, not that fun. Here's the thing. You know? Nobody really wants to be there. No. They just want their friends to think that they're there. Yes. Right? Yeah. You know, they just want, they want to know that you want me there is what, you know, people really want. Now yeah. I'm going to ask you a personal question, right? Okay. So you and I, now you're psychotherapy and, and I have a time machine. We get to go back. You're, you're 27 years old, quarter life crisis. You're crying in the bathroom. You and I walk in the bathroom. I don't get in trouble, you know, cause I'm with you and we're hanging out, mm -hmm. right? but like we go and we get to have a minute with the younger Tess. What would, what would we say to her? Or like, what, what would we, if we could give her a little gift, what would we say to her? Or what would we give to her? I think I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's all going to work out. It's not going to work out how you thought it was going to, but don't worry. It will all work out. And as cheesy as that sounds, it's, it's yeah. true. And I think that's the part about being young. And I, and I say this to my clients all the time. I say to them, like, you know, I'm not, I'm able to say these things to you, not because I'm some wise, you know, incredibly wise person. It's just because I'm old. And the longer <laughs> you're on this planet, the longer you've had experiences, you're just able to connect the dots, right? It's that Steve Jobs quote of connecting the dots. Like you cannot connect the dots looking forward. You can only do it looking backwards. Mm. So I'm at a point in my life now where I can look back in time and connect the dots and see, I didn't get that job. That was good. That relationship didn't work. Oh, good right? That relationship didn't work. So I could have this relationship or I could have this, or I could have that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it makes moving forward in my life so much easier. It's so much clearer because I know that like, oh, well, if this doesn't work out, something else will, or things will work out how I, how they should. And when you're young and you, ha you don't have that, right. Where you're like, well, I ever, because this is, this is the big thing mm -hmm. is one of the most common things that people say to me, it's like, I need to find my path. I want to find my path. I need to figure that out. Right. And so that's a piece of it is it's just like, yes, everyone will find their path. You know, you will find a relationship. You will find relationships. You will find jobs. You, you, all those things will happen for you. It just never happens how you think it is. <laughs> and Isn't that the truth. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the, the thing is, is that when we're young, we're competing with right? The, the fantasies that we created in our minds when we were in high school and college, right? Of what adulthood is going to look like. And I yeah. said, you know, reality is not, can never compete with fantasy. Never, yeah. ever, ever. So of course your reality doesn't look like what your fantasy is, but that's that big thing that happens for people, right? Where they've created in their minds exactly what the plan needs to be or what their life should look like or what a successful life should look like mm -hmm. and then they get out into reality and they're like oh this this sucks this isn't <laughs> at all what i want and, and instead of being able to say okay you know i have to shift and change my perception of it it's there's this feeling of i've done something wrong yeah oh, right? totally i made a mistake along the way i said no to this or i said yes to this or i I'm too lazy or I'm a loser, right? Like all of those negative thoughts come in. It's like, no, it's got nothing to do with any of that. It's just that no, you know, that's to know exactly what you want to do and everything that you want at age 18, 22, whatever age it is. It's crazy. Yeah. The competing with fantasy, I think. Yeah. So as a young guy, right in my head, going to be a billionaire. Right. And I'll be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want and have nobody to answer to. Right. Like that's the rock star in me. Uh, and then the reality is, is, okay, you want to get to a billionaire. What do you need to sacrifice? And you know, you got to add a lot of value and you're probably going to fail a lot to get there. Right. Some people just show up. That's not me. Right. Like they show up and magic happens. No, like I, I, I have to hit my thumb a lot with the hammer but like the fantasy of what it will be like to get there or to, to experience money or to not experience money or success or failure, that fantasy is such a 
pain in the ass because it's, it's always a lie, mm -hmm. right? Is when I get there, I'll be happy. When this happens, I'll be that. When, you know, um, hmm, I like that competing with fantasy. That's probably going to be the title of today's episode. <laughs> All right. So Tess, all right, Let, let's talk movies, right? Since okay. you're, in, you're in, I like the arts, I like film. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's a favorite movie and why? Um, well, I got to go back to Martin Scorsese. Yeah. So, I mean, my favorite Martin Scorsese movie was Taxi Driver. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And so um, I know people love Mean Streets, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. You know, and it's been a minute since I've seen the movie, but there was something, I think there's something about this idea of this person who, you know, I, I, this perception of like the famous, you're talking to me scene. Are you talking to me? That, that you're talking to me, yeah, you're talking to me. <laughs> Robert De Niro scene. Yeah. But there, there is right. That's, that's exactly fantasy versus reality of like how we see ourselves, like mm -hmm. how we, and how we want people to perceive us and how we see the world and how we want to come across. And the fact that what he, the main character and what he wanted and what he saw wasn't at all what was reality at, you know, like he just wasn't getting it at mm. all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love all of Martin Scorsese's movies. I was, I, I am, I mean, I think, I, and you know, I know this isn't very popular, but like it kills me about the Woody Allen stuff because Annie Hall was one of my favorite. I think it's one of the best all time comedies, yeah. romantic comedies of all time. It's unfortunate because now it's all very, you know, you have, you look at it in such a different lens now, but that was a great film, mm. you know? Yeah. I was just watching last night, Goodfellas. Ah, uh, yes. Martin, uh, he, yeah. he, he, he helped uh, do that, but he, in his movies, he creates some really great characters, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, out of all the movies that, you know, that he's done or that you've watched, like, cause you're a fan of film, like what movie do you think that you would, if you ever got back into acting, right. Or if you got mm -hmm. into Hollywood, which, which movie do you think that you would be a good fit in? <laughs> what that I would actually want to live in or that it would yeah, be, you that could, would center around me. Yeah. You could live in it or it could center around you. I've never asked this question before. It just popped in my head. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, it's so funny because uh, you know, I recently rewatched the Sopranos. Oh, and so good. So, you know, and it's interesting because watching it all like binge watching it, it's so different than watching it like week after week and then waiting a year for another 13 episodes. Yeah. And it's so interesting because when I was watching the movie, when I was watching the show, I said to my husband, I said, you know, I don't really like Tony Soprano so much. Like these characters, they seem so exciting and such a fantasy and like, ooh, to live this life and what would that be like? And then you see it all there. You're like, God, these are horrible people. They're like really <laughs> awful, terrible, awful people. Yeah. You know, like that, you know, what they're doing is, you know, it's they're just, they destroy people's lives. Like, you know, the, the people that they interact with, they're just doing them in. And so when I think back to a lot of the Martin Scorsese movies, because this is a big theme for him, right? It's yeah. been about religion and about, you know, and about mobsters, but also um, for him being a, you know, Italian American and, and all of that, I, I think like, where would I, would I even really want to be in any of these in any of these films at all. I do, I will say that um, uh, I love The Departed. I don't know if I'd wanna be in that world, <laughs> but I thought he did such a good job. I think that that's, you know, if you look at a movie like Goodfellas versus The Departed, right? It's sort of the same, same idea, same, like these are, you know, mobsters, yeah. but so, so different and such a different feeling. I think that's what makes him so brilliant is he takes sort of these same themes over and over again and just does it in a different way. And he's got a lot of movies that people haven't even seen um, that are really interesting. I can't remember any of the names of them now, but I mean, that are really, really interesting and different that people just don't talk about so much. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. The, the part of the music for Departed was incredible. Oh, yeah. Really good yeah. job. Um, now, as you are, you know, you've hit uh, psychotherapists, right? Like 
that that's a pretty high level of because you go to psychology and then you know what mm-hmm. what inspired you to go from psychology to psychotherapy like what what inspired you to go to that next level or and I might have it wrong there might not be levels like you know, whatever <laughs> but like well no I mean so in order to be a licensed therapist you have to you know get a master's degree and go through the process of becoming licensed and all of that yeah. so um you know again it's one of those things where, you know, you start something and then you're like, oh God, I didn't know this journey was going to be so arduous because becoming a licensed therapist is a very arduous journey, whether you go the PhD route or the master's level route. Um, for me, I think the biggest jump that was a hurdle within itself, but about, you know, um, I started about 10 years ago, I started incorporating coaching into the work that I did and I do. And then now I'm, I'm also a board certified coach and And really for me, the biggest hurdle has been, um, is really been around like building this business of like having products and having programs and sort of being out there, being on podcasts, like, you know, writing articles, all of that. Like for me, that's been so much harder and so much like, you know, such a leap because, and you know, this, right. Which is when you decide to put yourself out there, you're being very visible. Mm -hmm. And you're really like, sometimes I say to people, I wish I sold eyeglasses, right? Because if you don't want the glasses, it's like, okay, fine. You don't like these glasses. They're red. You don't care. But when you're selling you, like who you are and your thoughts and your intellectual property, it is incredibly, incredibly difficult. I think that's the piece that people don't quite get is I think they see all these influencers and they see all these people doing, doing all this stuff. It's like, no, but you're, you're having to be visible in you. And if someone doesn't like it, again, the therapist rational mind can go, okay, it's none of my business what you think. But at the same time, like you're really putting yourself out there. So for me, when I think about like levels and getting places, like the the becoming a therapist, like that was this intellectual hurdle and just time and putting in the hours and getting it done. It's been much more of these last seven years of just like, well, what am I going to do with all these things, all this knowledge that I have? Mm-hmm. Do I sit in an office and see client after client or do I put myself out there? Ooh, so, that's, that's yeah. a tough one because yeah. what, what, for putting yourself out there, right? You wanted to be in LA, you wanted to be you yeah. know, in film, right? How has that helped in, in, in putting yourself out there? Or maybe yeah. how has it hurt? No, I think it's helped. I mean, it is, it's funny because when I started moving in more into this um, uh, business of writing, writing and writing blogs and doing things and recording videos, it really, it hit me. I was like, oh, wow. Like all these years of like doing all the high school plays and all these years of being, you know, in front of people and having this dream, right. It all helped tremendously of of just being able to recognize like what it takes and what it is to say to yourself and say to the world, like, I want to do this thing that a lot of other people want to do too. And I'm going to go out there and compete Mm. and put myself out there. And um, I definitely think my time in Hollywood and just seeing actors and seeing what they went through and all of that has helped me tremendously kind of get through and understand this part of it too, right? Yeah. Because that's the other thing too, is that we see sort of these big movie stars, Brad Pitt or, you know, Angelina Jolie or whatever. And, but there are so many actors out there that work steadily, that have great lives that mm-hmm. like make good money and do all this stuff. It's like, not everyone has to be this household name. And it's, I feel the same way for myself too, which is, um, you know, I don't need to be, you know, I don't need to be Tony Robbins. Like, I don't need that. Like, and I'm not him. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can achieve success for myself in a way that is just, you know, the, whomever wants to follow me or wants to buy my products. Like it doesn't have to be this big thing. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. So I I, I love this, right? So you're creating what your goalpost is, right? You know, like what is success for you? Mm -hmm. Right. So you say, I don't need, you know, like, so you, you kind of like created some boundaries, right? Like, I don't need to be this. I don't need to be that. This to me is success. Mm-hmm. How do you know 
And ha- mm-hmm. like for, for guys like me who might not know what even success looks like, and we're just hard driving. Why are you doing work? It's hard. I don't know. I freaking swing hammers and I'm, I'm a caveman. I don't know mm-hmm. whatever the case may be. How can we learn to step outside of ourselves, create that here's what success looks like. And like, how do we step out of our own head just for a second? Show me yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. I, I would say it comes back to that self-awareness and slowing down. Right. So one of the best ways of gaining more self-awareness, when we talk about self-awareness, it's, it's the ability to recognize your thoughts and feelings in real time. Yeah. So your thoughts, right. And so the, if you're not able to do that, it's really about slowing down. And the best ways of learning how to do that is retraining your brain. So, and the way to do that is either through some kind of mindfulness practice of exercise, you know, doing something mindful every day, several times a day, or, you know, I know people are so sick of hearing this, but meditation, like study after study after study has shown that mindfulness meditation, they are the best things for anxiety and they are the cornerstones of how you learn how to be more aware of your thoughts in actual real time. So if you are someone who's like, I really have no idea what success is, I would really start by like, put your phone down for a second, get quiet, you know, and ask yourself some of these questions around like what, you know, if you could snap your fingers and have the things that you want, you know, what is it that you're really looking for? Like, what is it that you truly, truly want? And if you're like, I don't know, I have no idea, then you know, you don't, I think that's the other part of it too, is we have such this instant world of wanting to know, like, well, I don't know what I want. So it's like, okay, right now you don't need to know. So stop and slow down and start asking yourself these questions of around, like, you know, start auditing your day of, I did this for an hour. How do you feel? You know, like, do you, did you like it? (laughs) You know, did you, did you enjoy it? Did it create anxiety for you? Or was it, you know, because, because really work that we want to do, right. We all want to achieve this flow state, this point at which, where you're not looking at the time, you're just really so focused and so in it. Right. And so what happens is, is that you, you've got to really stop and start noticing throughout your day, several times a day, like, what have I been doing? What am I thinking about? Like, did I enjoy that? Did I not? How do I feel about it? How do I feel in my body? You know, is there in my body, do I feel anxiety in my body? Like, you know, what's happening here? Like mindfulness is essentially just mindfully doing something like mindfully taking a walk, which is no phone, no headphones, like just walking along and noticing the wind, you know, against your skin, the crackling of the leaves on the ground, right? Like that's a mindful walk that you can do for five minutes. It's just learning how to shut everything out and just notice what's going on around you. And what that does is it's, it's, changing the neurons in your brain. And it's, it's helping you learn how to start to notice what's happening and notice what you're feeling in the present moment, because a lot of why we do the things that we do are about thoughts and feelings that we have either about the past or thoughts and feelings that we think we're going to have in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So the past is usually about depression and the future is usually about anxiety. And so most of the time we, right, we yell at our partners because, you know, not because of something they said or did, but because we're stressed about something that may or may not happen in the future or something that happened in the past or someone that hurt us in the past. And so now we're right. And so the goal is to learn how to be present in now so that your interactions with other people are based on what's really happening for you here. And that's the same for you, just as you would with other relationships. That's what you want to have, right? For yourself, for yourself. So that's why I keep saying like, well, stop, slow down, like ask yourself, do I like this? Do I not like this? Like, and through asking yourself those questions, doing that consistently, you will start to gain some clues into, oh, I like these parts of my job, or I like this parts about growing this business. And I don't like these parts. And what you really want to do is start to figure out like, okay, so how do I do more of the things that I like and less of these things? Because that is what, right? Like success is really based on 
how you feel every day. Hmm. Not our bank account. <laughs> Not the size of our member. <laughs> Not how well, yeah, I mean, that's what, it, <laughs> and I think that that's the part that's really, really hard is, is that those are measurable numbers, right? That, that we have assigned in our society as being mm -hmm. like, this is good, mm -hmm. right? This bank account is good. This is bad. But um, again, like, you know, if you want to achieve some level of peace and happiness and a feeling mm -hmm. of success, then you've got to let go of the numbers, right? Cause they're just, they're just there. They're just numbers, right? Like money is all just a construct, right? Like what $5 means to you is different than what $5 means to me. Yeah. You used to be able to get, you know, a sub at Subway. Now it's, you know, <laughs> you can't now get it's a lot. anything. <laughs> now you can't get another <laughs> five bucks. So Tess, like as you're building out your, you know, your practice and, and helping, mm -hmm. you know, helping people, uh, kind of finding themselves, how to, you know, be mindful, how to heal, how to find the true you. Like I'm looking mm -hmm. at some of your courses on online right now. And, uh, you know, like what is, what, what problem do you like solving in, in people's <laughs> lives? Like if you yeah. could like, if you could pick the problem that you get to just focus on this problem for the rest of your life, what's that mm -hmm. one problem that you like fixing in men more than anything else? Um, I would say, it's learning how to, which is what true you is about and why it's called that is that so much of, right. The biggest issue that all my clients, but it, especially my male clients struggle with is decision-making. Like, how do I, how do I make a decision? Mm -hmm. And so much of decision-making is about learning how to trust your own instincts. It's about learning how to listen to quiet things down and listen to that voice in your head that tells you like, this is what's right for me. And that's the thing that I really love working on is just helping people really understand for themselves, not what your parents think success is or what Instagram tells you what success is, but like, what is success for you and helping people really let go of that belief of like, what's well, this number? It's this number. It's this number. It's like, well, no, what if it wasn't this number? Hmm. Like a lot of these things, I think, are questions that people don't have never even pondered in their lives of like, what happens if I let go of the number? I, I, I believe that people need to have goals and I believe that people need to go after the things that they want. Like I, I'm not, I'm not advocating people just sitting around and like waiting for things to happen for them. Right. You have to go out and take action in order for things to happen for you. But how our lives end up are just a series of choices that we make. And as long as you are making choices that feel right for you at that moment in time, you will, you will continue to end up where you need to be, where you want to be. And that's the biggest part of it is just helping people really figure out for themselves, like, who am I? What is it that I want? Which is why I love working with young people, because that's really, it's, it's not your teenage years, it's the twenties into the thirties and even beyond that you're really asking yourself these questions of like, who am I? You know, what do I want my life to be about? Like, what is, you know, what is the purpose of, you know, why am I here? I've got that tattooed on my arm. Oh, really? It, yeah. It says, what, who am I? Or? Who am I tattooed on my arm? Ah, oh, I love it. Yeah. I asked Wait a minute, myself, but is it upside? I can't, it's upside okay, down. No, okay, yeah. Cause the camera's kind of weird. Hold on. I'll show you. Okay. Okay. That's, oh, I love it. Yeah. And I like it. It's in that Times New Roman. Like, wow. Good type. job on the font. Yeah. Well, <laughs> font. I actually, I put ink on the typewriter and that's how I got. Oh. No, I'm just no, but yeah. So I got this tattoo on me. I think it was an important time in my life where, you know, I was standing on a bridge thinking of swan diving off and mm -hmm. I felt you know, like that question popped in my head. I felt God asked me that question. Like, who are you? And I was like, I don't fucking know. And he's like, yeah. well, figure that out. And you'll help some dudes I'm like, all right, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, give me a little bit of purpose. But yeah, yeah. I, I think everybody needs to ask himself that question. That's, I mean, essentially that's why I got a tattoo on my arm. So I love the fact that you just, you got where we're like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> kindred spirits sort yes. of, right right but you're over on yeah. the west coast on the east coast but like there's a we're, we're connected here via podcast this is so yes. cool um tess as as you're building out what does the future look like for for you like what what do you want the future to look like for you that's a good question um 
you know, I, um, for me, I, you know, and especially now it's the end of the year and you're always right. We're always asking ourselves like, what do I want next? You know, mm-hmm. what do I want for the next year? Um, you know, for me, I think it's, it's the same thing. I've, I too, and I tell this to my clients all the time, which is like, I am not perfect. Like there is no, you know, just because I have this knowledge and I talk about it doesn't mean that I too don't struggle with some of the things that we're talking about. So for me, it's that same thing of, for me, I think it's a constant asking myself, you know, what is it that I want? How do I want to live my life? You know, what is it that what's going to make me happy? Um, 2020 was as for a lot of people, but I think especially people in the mental health field was a crazy, you know, was a hard year. Like it was, I often say, you know, after the George Floyd um, uh, murder that week, like that Friday, I think I went to bed at like 738. I think it was still light out, like exhausted, like mentally, mentally exhausted, just, you know, managing everybody's feelings and everything that was going on in the world. And, and so 2020 was exhausting and 2021 for me has been really very much about like healing and my health. And so I want 2022 to be, um, just really being able to enjoy the time and effort that I've put in to the work that I've done and being able to exactly what I've been saying, like really be able to slow down and enjoy success, whatever that is for me that at that time, because I too, like everybody else, I get caught up in the numbers and I earn this much or this happened or that happened. And it's really about, right. Like how you feel every day. Yeah. And I feel very lucky that I get to do something that I love to do, which is not everybody's situation. You know? Yeah. Exactly. So being on the show and having an audience, you know, like I, I hear, you know, from guys who are struggling with stuff and I wind mm-hmm. up, you know, I, I do some work with fire, police, military, mm-hmm. kind of like yeah. walking people off the line, just PTSD kind of stuff, you know, just a little bit of just mostly just listening. How do you manage carrying the weight of people's mental state consistently? Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I struggle with this sometimes where I just have to go decompress but how do you do it? Cause you do this as a profession, carrying people's mental health. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the longer that you do this work, the better it is. I, you know, I, I definitely think that, um, it was a lot, it weighed a lot more on me when I was in grad school. And in the first couple of years, like you do feel so much personal responsibility, like, oh my God, this person feels suicidal. I have to, mm-hmm. I have to do something. I have to intervene, um, for better or for worse. Like the longer that you're in this, it's not that you become apathetic, but you're really able to separate yourself a lot from, you know, like that's this person, their life, their experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so over the years, it's gotten, you know, that part about it's gotten a lot better. I think for me, you know, having a child, I might, like I said, my son's 14. And so having him has been one of the best things is that because I just walk, I can walk away from all that. And it's like, I have this other thing that needs me, that needs my time, needs my attention and needs my focus. And, um, And he is very much right. Like why, you know, why I do what I do and why earn money. And like, you know, so for him, like having him and having my husband and we have dogs, like I'm here in my shed, the shed that we built in our backyard after the pandemic and a she shed, my she shed. Yeah. And so, you know, just walking out of the she shed and being able to walk into my home and be like, okay, this is, you know, like, this is my life. This is my reality. This is what's happening for me right now has been, um, really helpful, but it is, it's, it's ongoing. Like you constantly, as a therapist, you, you constantly have to find different ways to like, you know, do all of the things that, you know, we're preaching to our clients all the time about exercising and vacations and all of that. So I know for myself, if I'm saying something to a lot of clients, I know I'm like, oh, I need to listen to this. (laughs) Like I should be taking this in. Yeah. But it is, I, I, you know, I feel like with first responders, police that fire, that is a rough one. I mean, mm. that is, that is, I can't imagine what it's like because those jobs are really, really tough. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, I, the other part of it too, is 
just having your own private practice, like you get a hodgepodge of clients. So not everything's so intense. Like I think that if you're just exclusively working with police or firefighters all the time, I can't imagine what that's like. Mm. Yeah. Right. Like I get, you know, I have a lot of tech people, <laughs> a lot of Googlers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's, it's not, it's not as intense as all of that. You yeah. know, as it is. Well, I think everybody, everybody has trauma. Everybody has background. Everybody yeah. has history. Everybody's been scarred. Um, so I'm, I think it's a cool field. I, I at one point I wanted to be a psychologist. Oh. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I'm thankful. I, uh, I'm thankful this path kind of chose me and I chose it. Uh, but I appreciate what you do out there helping oh. people heal. That's <laughs> pretty darn cool. Tess, yeah. what, uh, what question should I've asked you in this conversation? <laughs> that, oh God. It could be anything, personal, business, psycho what psychology you stuff. What should ask me? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. What should you have asked me? I don't know. Okay. Here's that's another a one. hard one. All okay. right. Here, here's, here's an easier one. These are tough. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is, this, is, this is the fun part, right? All right. So <laughs> if, if, you, um, if you had the ability to change one thing in in the world i gotta be careful how i say this if you have the ability to snap your finger and it fixes a problem in the world what would that problem be that that you uh care so much about oh my god but there's so many i know you gotta pick one i know well the first one that came to mind is racism but i think that that is um because I, it just, I was just reading something yesterday and you, you realize just how, how pervade, like how deep seated this is yeah. in our culture yeah and how we keep thinking, okay, it's getting better. It's getting better. And you're like, no, it's not. No, it's not. So you it's fix not that. getting better. That's yeah. pretty cool. All right. So uh, for the guys listening in, if they're like, Hey, actually I could use some help, you know, finding the, the true me. Uh, helping, you know, love myself, helping find my path, helping, you know, create that, that peace, that inner clarity. Uh, where could people go to connect with you and get some help? Yeah, you can go to my website. So it's Tess Brigham, Tess Brigham coaching.com. Either one will get you there. And um, so you can sign up for my newsletter. I have, it's called Sunday mornings with Tess. And I give you lots of really great information and something to a practice of the week, something to work on. Um, and if you go on the website, you'll see, I do, I have a program called true you, and then I have smaller programs that are part of the true you, if you just want one particular part of it. And, um, and, you know, I have, um, a book, uh, an ebook, um, uh, called radically practical. Um, so all of that's on the website, or if you just want, I'm on Instagram. So if you just follow me on Instagram, I'm there too. And. I give a lot of great, you know, information and advice and help and all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, if you, and I have a blog on the website, so, you know, I like to give, I mean, this is the part, right. You want to give people lots of great free information and then there's also things to buy. So very cool. All right. So guys listening in, you'll be able to go to her, her website. Uh, we'll put that in the show notes, click on it. If you can use some help, always reach out to our guests. Say thank you for being on the show, but if there's something that they're saying and you could use some help and you think it's them reach out and uh, engage that conversation. Uh, Tess, thanks for being on the show. Fellas, thanks for listening in. If you're working through something in your brain, uh, if you'd like to be on the show, either way, if you have some questions for me, head on over to Uncensored Advice for Men, fill out a quick form. I usually will call or email you or someone from our group will uh, connect with you with the right resources or with us. Um, hope you guys are great. Love you guys. And we'll talk to you all on the next episode. See you guys.